It will seem odd to sing at the end from where I hope is the middle. These things, though, are often left unspoken, and who will know if I never tell? That when I die, I would have hoped for certain things to go my way, so I may rest in the eternal peace of a soul fitting end. If indeed there be a soul. I have attended many funerals and heard the mourners say they hoped the proceedings were as the deceased would have wanted. I have witnessed the overly Christian tones of an atheist farewell and imagined a grimace from within the polished walls of the coffin. I have farewelled close family members and been shocked at how little I knew. I barely knew my mother-in-law Ours was a late marriage, but there was something beautiful, spiritual, in the moist softness of pink rose petals parting from my fingertips, and the coffin lowered to reunion with her long dead husband beneath. I have no idea who will be left to think of me or who will care when I pass. My husband, parents, children, my remaining sister, nephews, beloved grandchild. It could happen tomorrow or in 50 years, and maybe I would have changed my mind, but the things I write of here today have been set in my thoughts for already a decade. Before I proceed with the order of service, let me offer this to see how it bears out in time and whether there is any truth in premonition of one's own death. It is simply this that when I was 13, I felt strongly that I would live only to the age of 55, which to a teenager seemed ancient. Although I had no vision of how I would die, and maybe this is a family trait rising to the surface perhaps too soon, as I know that my father has his funeral mapped out to save us from uncertainty and disorder. Possibly my need to get this down on paper is prompted by my sister's death at 43 and a nephew's at 21. How unfair seems illness to cut lives so short so swiftly and suspend them cruelly in comas. The waiting is a sentence on the living, yet kindles hope. I am not keen to go, although I feel I have come almost to terms with death but I don't wish to linger. Please, if there is very little hope, turn off the switch and let me sink into sleep. But for your own sake, stay within the law. I don't want a mournful sermon to send me off. This is how I hope it will be. Please do your best, those who are left. First, let the surgeons take my organs in memory of my sister, if they can improve the lives of others. I'd like a simple white coffin with no ornamental extravagance. If my hair is still long, let me wear it down. Some flowers would be a nice touch. Simple daisies, a small variety, will do. I am a lover of daisy chains. My husband would say I'm romantic. Too romantic. But I know what is important to me. And I'd like to lie among nice things before the rot of worms and pessimism sets in. Sorry, my love. It is true what Elliot said. Humankind cannot bear too much reality. Though I have my realistic streak too. I've learned that too much realism is unkind to the spirit. Dress me in a long flowing dress of soft, simple cotton in white or blue or saffron. Perhaps a little embroidery. And no shoes or underwear. I insist on bare feet and no nickeline. And let my breasts fall free. I'd like to wear my wedding ring and I'm always seen with earrings that dangle and sparkle, but no necklaces, please. 
I think it would be symbolic to send me into the flames with a book clasped to my chest. And there is only one that carries a weight of meaning. The blue bound volume of T.S. Eliot, 1962, given to me by my auntie. You'll find it on a bookshelf somewhere. I'll become ash with burnt Norton. Let me be. It's amusing. As for makeup, I do like it, and although there will be no one to see it, I think it will hide the pallor of grey. But keep it simple and understated. No bright lipstick, just a subtle shade of muted berry to keep my lips moist. If you discover my strange habit of keeping my children's lost teeth and find them scattered throughout my drawers, in little boxes and envelopes, or the sachet of hair from my son's first cut, I think I can finally part with these. I won't take them with me. I'll be in the mood for letting go of life's little oddities and mother comforts. My service should take place outside if I'm lucky enough to go in spring or the cooler part of summer. I prefer a cathedral of trees and the openness of sky to the trappings and plastic fernery of a chapel. Keep it short and simple. Let only a few determined speakers tell of their memories. That is all very well and perhaps necessary if there is any grieving. But I'm keen to have some poetry, so please, poets, come and read. Send me off, not up, with verses and bring a guitar. Even better, a saxophone. There's only one bit of the Bible I'll be happy to have read. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-13. And when it gets to the part, when I became a man, please do me a favour and say, woman, I am what I am. I've already made it clear that music and poetry should be invited to the service. But please bring me a Buddhist monk with bells and gongs and chants and a prayer on the four immeasurables love, compassion, joy and equanimity. Scented flowers are beautiful to me like roses, jasmine and tropical fringe penny so cover my coffin with these and imagine me smiling as I lie in wait for the furnace. I will be happy. Don't feel that afterwards the guests should take tea as I was not a drinker. Drink wine or beer and be merry. When the ashes have been raked and bottled, I hope that someone will drive me to my resting place of choice and scatter me in three. Part of me will go to my husband. If he should go before me, he'll scatter a third on his grave and water me in. If still living, he may wish to hold me for a while. Two-thirds of me should be driven to Maruk and scattered at a path with the Murray where there's a rose garden beside the river. Pour me over the roses and I will enter their roots. The final portion should go into the river where pelicans nest and I shall return to the epiphany of my youth. Whatever it was that remained with me all those years from the time I was 16 and a group of us slept in cars beside the water. That morning was supernatural with mist. It was bitter cold. My clothes were damp. I stood in the early light and watched a pelican rise into the white wisps of daybreak. I don't know what happened, but I was unexpectedly one with trees, birds, river, mist. And as I write this, it still stirs my solar plexus, catches in my throat and induces a tear. I don't know what it was. But that's how I'd like to end. Returning to a sacred morning. Ash to earth. Ash to water.